Thank you for joining us for Sermons on Demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. We provide these videos as a way to share the pulpit messages and teachings offered at Friendship Grace Brethren Church. If you find these videos a helpful resource, please drop us a note at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com. Now open your Bibles and get ready to dig into the Word of God. Okay, let's, uh, let's begin uh, with a word of prayer. Father, thank you for all that you do. Thank you for loving us, calling us to be your children, for teaching us how you want us to engage with folks around us. Thank you for this series from uh, Dr. Tackett and the instructions that he's uh, laying out from your word on how we're to live and, and act with people around us. We ask that you be honored by everything that we say and do. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, this morning we are going to do the first portion of Tour 8, <coughs> Engaging with Wisdom. <coughs> this may be a difficult, and he'll say the same thing, this may be a difficult uh, um, tour to go through. I've watched it twice and I'm still not sure I understand or have rationalized everything in my brain. So, let's go. Well, greetings to all of you. Are you ready for our next tour? Yes. Are you sure? <laughs> Let me recall what you signed and what I have signed, because I've now signed it too. Gazing upon the face of God can be dangerous. You can lose your self. I will not run away from the face of God. And I've signed this as well. And I want to remind you of that because today we're going to go back to the epic of redemption. And we're going to be going into a difficult place. And even I am not sure I want to go into this cave. But we need to, because this is something we need to return to over and over again. If we're going to have a steadfast sacrificial zeal that seeks the true good, the shalom, of those who are providentially near us, then you and I are going to have to go back continually to this difficult place. Because it is here, if God will allow, that we are going to draw closer and closer to him to understand who he is, but to understand the depth of what he has done for us. So I uh, always tremble a little before I go into this cave. But it'll be nice to go into the cave with dear friends. And so we'll walk this uh, together. And I don't mean to overstate it, um, but my prayer is that God is really going to allow us to see him more closely than we've ever seen him before. And as Paul uh, cried, that you know, we might understand the depth of that hesed agape love of God. Okay, so that's, that's where we're headed. Now, we've already talked about how this book is what I call the consummate book of the understatement. We already referenced, remember, that... He made the stars also? I mean, that is, that's phenomenal to me. 
And then it just says, and they crossed over on dry ground. I mean, well, are you kidding me? They, yeah, they crossed over on, on dry ground. And my personal favorite is this. Two men were talking to him, Moses and Elijah. <laughs> Wait a second. Hold, those guys are dead, right? But it just, you know, two men were talking to him, Moses and Elijah. This is the scripture. God simply states the truth, and then he moves on. He doesn't go back and embellish it. God doesn't feel like he's got to now repeat it and say it a different way for you to understand. He just says it. And they crucified him. No doubt you have uh, read the accounts of what crucifixion really is like. Maybe some of you have read some of the medical accounts like. There are no details given to us about what the Roman soldiers did. We know historically what they did. But the scripture just simply says, and they crucified him. And so I'm still amazed that the scripture simply states that we are to love our neighbor as ourself. And so we've asked this question before, but it would be good for us to ponder it one more time, and that is, well, why have we ignored it? Why have we individually ignored it? Why have we ignored it as the body of Christ? And I think there are a lot of reasons, maybe even individual reasons, you've thought through already. I hope you have. It's possible it's just because we didn't know it. We were ignorant. You know, kind of like Josiah in the law, which we'll look at. It's possible that it's just simply because of the lies and the counterfeit. We've talked about the counterfeits associated with the word love. And we're inundated with those in our culture over and over again. It's also possible, and for me, I think this is one of the key things that keeps me from fulfilling the royal law. And most likely it will be one of the key things that will keep you and others from doing it. This is, it's, not, it's not rocket science. You know, it's not that we can't understand what God has asked us to do. The question is, you know, is that going to bury itself in our heart, that we're going to believe that God has really given us the privilege, you know, to do this work, this kingdom work? And so, most likely, our own story is going to get in the way a lot. But there's one more here that I want to call your attention to that could be the biggest in all of this. And I say that because the Scripture links together our lack of love for others to what we're going to look at today in our tour. And that is that we think little of his love. In other words, we don't think highly enough of the depth of that hesed agape love of God and what he has done for us. And maybe we think a little too much of ourselves that God really didn't have to forgive us that much. Mm -hmm. And so if that's the case, then we think that he really didn't have to spend a whole lot to redeem me, right? And the scripture will say that there's a link between our love for others and how much we think of his love and how much we think of what we have been forgiven. I am always fascinated, as I have already told you, about these encounters that finite man has with the living God. <clears throat> and, of course, Jesus, when he was here physically on the earth, he encountered many people. But this one is very intriguing to me. Jesus is now dining with Simon. This is not Simon Peter. Uh, you know, Simon Peter that we know, the member of Jesus' small group. But this was Simon the Pharisee. And so Jesus is now in the home of Simon having dinner with him. And if you recall, we drew the triclinium. In those days, they didn't sit at tables like we did. They most likely were reclining at table. It means they were leaning on the table and their feet 
were out behind them. And so Jesus is dining at the home of Simon, and then this event plays out in a very interesting way. It's strange to us to think that this could ever happen. A woman then enters and begins to wash Jesus' feet with her tears and to anoint him with oil. And she's not just crying, she's sobbing because her tears are enough to wash his feet. But what is interesting in this story is that Jesus ignores her. Jesus is still speaking to Simon. He's just still having dinner, having a conversation, while she's back there weeping and wailing. And I don't mean to make light of this, but you know, when I think about this, I think Jesus is just having a conversation with Simon. You know, and, and maybe he says, you know, Simon, this lamb is really delicious, you know, uh, or, you know, hey, I like, I like what you've done with the, the furniture here. So whatever, you know, it's a conversation that's going on while she's back there weeping and wailing and crying and anointing him with oil. And for a long time, I said, I don't understand this. You know, why would Jesus ignore her? And then I, I realized that Jesus was waiting on Simon. Because the story then tells us that Simon is thinking something. The Pharisee, Simon, he's, see, he's looking at this woman. He sees her. He can hear her. Everybody can hear her. She's weeping. She's wailing. She's washing her feet. And Jesus is just talking to Simon. And Simon thinks, if this man, if Jesus were a prophet, if he were a true prophet, he would stop this woman because he would know that she is a sinner. Now, the scripture doesn't say this, it doesn't use these words, but the implication is that this woman is most likely a prostitute. And yet here she is, washing Jesus' feet with her tears, anointing him with oil, and Jesus is letting her do that. And Simon says, if he were a true prophet, he'd stop this prostitute from touching him. And then and Jesus speaks to Simon. <clears throat> he says, Simon, and, and again, remember, J Jesus is still, he's ignoring her. He says, Simon. A certain money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now, which of them will love him more? And Simon answered, the one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And Jesus said to him, you have judged rightly. And then... Jesus turns and he looks at this woman. And he says, Simon, when I came in here, you did not wash my feet. You did not anoint me with oil. Hmm. But ever since we have been here, this woman has been weeping, sobbing, crying, washing my feet with her tears and anointing me with oil. And then Jesus says some more things, but the bottom line is that then Jesus turns to Simon and says, he who is forgiven little loves little. And so we see this link that Jesus is making here. If we love little, if we find ourselves loving little, then maybe it's because we think that we've been forgiven little. And if we think we've been forgiven little, then we will think little of his love and the sacrifice that he made for us. John writes, in this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us 
and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. That Jesus came and the payment that he made was a payment that was sufficient to pay for your sins. And the question is, how big a payment do we think that is? And it's easy for us to think, well, I don't think it was a whole lot. Not that we openly or objectively think that, but you know what I'm saying? We can find ourselves over time not thinking it, that it was a whole lot or thinking much of it, maybe. And so John writes, we love because we first loved us. And that is that link again. There's that link between our love and his love for us or what we think his love is for us. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So he who thinks he is forgiven little loves little. And that is what we want to look at. And so buckle up. We're going to go back to the garden again, but we're not going to go back to the garden of Eden. We're going to go back to the garden of Gethsemane. For those of you who have been there, I've confessed to you when I first went to the garden of Gethsemane, I wept uncontrollably when I was there. Gethsemane is an Aramaic word that means oil press. And that's very, very appropriate because Jesus was in an oil press in the Garden of Gethsemane. Do you remember that it is here that Jesus is crying out to God? For the first time now in everything that we have seen about Jesus, he is in agony before the Father. He says things like this. He says that he was sorrowful, that he was troubled. He said, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Do, do you recall any time in the scripture when Jesus embellished things, when he exaggerated about anything? He never does. He never did. And so when he says, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death, he wasn't just making up some words here. He was at the point of death. That's how much he was grieving. You know, the scripture even says that he was sweating drops of blood we don't know in that language there whether actually there was some blood in, in his perspiration or whether it is saying that is how deep his sorrow was. But nevertheless, it's telling us something about the state that Jesus is in in the, in the garden. And even most remarkable, Jesus now comes to the point where he cries to the Father, and he says, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. I grew up uh, in a church that had stained glass windows. And this was one of the windows in my church. Or how that stained glass window depicted Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. That's a fairly nice pastoral scene, is it not? You know, Jesus is looking like he's having a really nice time here. And in fact, we have the beams of light coming down on him and, and uh, things are fine. Uh, but that is not, that's not the picture of what we see in the scripture of Jesus in the oil press. It's hard to even imagine what that might look like. But he was in agony. Mm -hmm. He was in agony to the point of death. 
to the point that which he cried out to the Father, is it possible that I don't have to do this? Yeah, not my will, but your will be done. Yeah, and, and by the way, that we have to cry that every day. And remember, Jesus did three times. Three times, the scripture says, remember? In the midst of this agony, he then said, not my will, but your will be done. He came out, the disciples were asleep, and he said, can you not wait for me? And then he went back, he cried out the same thing again in agony, and then he said, let your will be done, not mine. And then he came back, and then the scripture says he went back and said the same thing again the third time. Possibly that is Jesus giving us an example of how often we have to say, not my will, but your will be done. But the reality is that Jesus is in the garden of Gethsemane, and he is in an oil press. He is in agony, deep agony, to the point of death. And so the the question I want us to ponder is, why? What was it that caused him this agony? In the garden. Was it the humiliation? Was it the thorns? If any of you have been to Israel and seen these thorns, if you've just gone through a thorn patch, you think about having this shoved down on your head, you know, the scalp is very sensitive. Humiliation, the thorns, was that it? Matthew records, and the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters. And they gathered the whole battalion before him. And they stripped him, how humiliating, and put a scarlet robe on him. And twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand. And kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and they spit on him. And then they took the reed and struck him on the head while he's wearing the crown of thorns. Do you think this is what was causing the agony in the garden? The humiliation and the thorns? Do you think that's what he was crying? No? Was it the scourge? The Romans were good that torturing people. The scourge was used to get people to confess to something. Eusebius writes of this and says, their bodies were frightfully lacerated. I almost hate to read this to you. Christian martyrs in Smyrna were so torn by the scourges that their veins were laid bare and the inner muscles, sinews, even entrails were exposed. Was it the scourge? Isaiah tells us, I believe, exactly what it looked like. There were many who were appalled at him. His appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being. And his form marred beyond human likeness. Was it the scourge? And the scripture. And they took Jesus and scourged him. That's all. And they scourged him. Was that it? Was it the scourging? which probably none of us can even imagine, nor do we want to even think about or imagine what that would have been like. Do you think this is what was driving him to the point of death? No. Was it the crucifixion? Cicero called crucifixion the extreme and ultimate punishment of slaves. The ultimate punishment of slaves. The Romans knew how to do torture and how to inflict pain. Josephus called it the most pitiable of deaths. And the scripture simply says, and they crucified him. It doesn't tell us 
about the nails. These are replicas of the the nails that the Romans used, the spikes that the Romans used to nail the hands or wrists to the cross, to nail the feet to the cross. The scripture doesn't tell us about all this. It doesn't give us a description. Horrific. Is this what Jesus was in agony over? Is this what was causing him to cry out to the Father? What was it then? What was it that was causing Jesus the agony? What do you think? What was causing the agony? Sin. Pardon me? Sin and separation from the Father. Separation from God. How do we know that? Because he cried that out. Eli, Eli. I'm a Sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Yeah, I think this is what it was. I think this is what it was. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And I want us to think a little deeper here for a second because I want us to contemplate the fact of the Trinity because we usually think that it is only Jesus who's suffering here. Mm. Mm. What if you were the Father and you saw your Son going through this? What would it do to you? The triune God is mysterious to us, and yet it is not mysterious. Jesus is God. The Father is God. The Holy Spirit is God. They are one in essence, and yet somehow they are three in persons, and yet they have been united for all eternity. They have been one for all eternity. And now all of a sudden... Something is happening. I don't know what it is, but I know this. Jesus was in agony, and I, I agree with you. I think this is what he didn't want to have happen. This is what he cried out, Father, is it possible that we don't have to go through this? And I think it's we. I'd like to ask you also another question that has troubled me. I've asked this of students as well. How long do you think this lasted? How long did this separation, or whatever was going on here, <clears throat> that Jesus is, is now suffering from, experiencing, how long do you think that went on? I've had, I've had some Students say three days. And I say, why? Well, because he was... I've had some say well, three hours. I say, why? Well, there was darkness over the land. and I've had some say, well, I think three seconds. I say, why three seconds? Because I think that's how long it took him to cry. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And to some extent, I, I think about this and I think, well, yeah, in our time, we don't know. In our time, I, I don't know how long that lasted. But again, to think about the eternality of God. I began to think about the omniscience of God. You know, if so, I don't know, have any of you had a root canal or something like that? And maybe if you haven't, you've heard about it. It's sometimes used in comic, uh, comedy and so forth <laughs> as something that, that's not something you want to go through. Or childbirth. <laughs> Been through childbirth. What does the scripture say about the pain of childbirth? 
How long does it last? Mm. It's over, and then the joy of the child, right? And you, you begin to forget. Now, now that doesn't mean you can't recall some things about it, but you think God has forgotten this? Mm. No. Who is interceding for us right now? Jesus. And when he intercedes for us, what is he appealing to? To for, the Father. Pardon me? To the Father. He's appealing to the Father. And what, it, what he's appealing, uh, it sounds like if he's interceding for us, you know, it's almost like there's this continual forgiveness and so forth. So, well, how do you pay for that? What, did you, what did, do you think the Father says? Oh, wait a second. You can't, we can't just forgive that. And Jesus says, oh, now, you remember? You, do you remember back there? And do you think the, the, the Father's saying, oh, no, wait a second. Okay, it's coming to me. It's coming. Tell me a little bit more. How clearly do you think the Father remembers this cry? Mm. Mm. And I think in the omniscience of God, if you just look at the omniscience of God, there's something eternal about this thing. Mm. I'm not saying I understand it, but in the eternality of God, it wasn't just to get it over with, you know, that, because I think, I, I, I know each one of you, and, and I, I really, I would guess, you may, you may question what I'm about to say. I think each one of you would give your life for someone else. I, I think you would. And in some cases, you think about it and you say, well, you know, get it over if it's some, you know, whatever, line me up and shoot me or something. It, but what if it was something forever? What if it was something that went on and on and on. Would we be willing to do it? Mm -hmm. I, don't, I, I don't know if I would. Mm -hmm. C.S. Lewis had a very interesting way to illustrate the eternality of God. He said, if you had a sheet of paper and could extend it in both directions endlessly, representing the eternality of God, and then drew a short line on the paper the line would represent all of time engulfed in that eternal nature of God. And I love that illustration, even though we all know that when you try to put in finite terms the eternality of God and all of the attributes of God that are eternal and infinite and all that stuff, we fall short somewhere. And yet it's a great illustration for us because it helps us recognize that God is omnipresent. If we think he is omnipresent, he's omnipresent in time as well as physical places. And that is why Jesus, Jesus, if you ever contemplated this, Jesus didn't say, I was the Alpha and I will be the Omega. As we might say, why? Because we're caught up in time. No, he says, I am the Alpha. I am the Omega. I am the beginning and I am the end. Why? Because he is ever present. Now, that's hard for us because you and I are so trapped in the cause and effect of time that it's difficult for us even to contemplate that God is eternal like this. And so I'm not trying to get us to somehow to be able to fully understand the eternal nature of God and the infinite nature of God and all of the attributes of God that are both eternal and infinite. I can't, we can't do that because have you ever thought about this? It struck me sometimes in math and we're talking about uh, infinite numbers and series and, and infinity that you know, if you head off in this direction and, and, you, and you go for a thousand years, you haven't gotten any closer to the end, nor have you gotten any farther away from the beginning. You know, it just, it blows your mind. We are trapped in the dash here in time, and that's the only way we can think. But God is not. God is outside of time. And we're not trying to somehow get our minds to the point where we can understand all of that. But what I, 
want us to contemplate is that this cry of the God who is from everlasting to everlasting, that this cry is like a a cry that stands for eternity. This penalty that's being paid on, on your behalf and my behalf is a penalty that is being paid for all future. It's a penalty that pays in the entire past. There's something eternal about it. And so when Jesus cries, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I think we must contemplate that this was not just a momentary thing that Jesus could get, get by real quickly. Now, don't, do not mistake at all what we're saying here. We're not saying that Jesus is separated from the Father right now. He's not. We're just talking about the eternality of this event that was sufficient to pay the penalty. What is the penalty of our sins? He's separated from God for how long? Forever. Did Jesus pay that? Yes, he did. In full. And we know there is something eternal about this. We look... Remember when John is caught up to heaven and he's weeping because there's no one found worthy to open the scroll. And one of the elders comes to him and says, weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has conquered so that he can open the scroll. And John says, behold, He beheld a lamb standing as though it had been slain. Why does the scripture say that? Aren't we well past that? Didn't that happen in the past? Why does the lamb now stand as though it had been slain? Why? Because there's something eternal about this sacrifice that he still bears. There's another place in... In the book of Revelation 2, it talks about the lamb who was slain from the foundation of the world. There's some disagreement about how those words are arranged in in the scripture. In the Greek, slain from the foundation of the world is, is right next to the lamb. Some think it applies to the book, the lamb's book of life. But even if that has been written from the foundation of the world, what does that imply? That the sacrifice has eternal ramifications. Now, I, you know, I look at a lot of you, and you are still young. But my guess is that you're old enough to recognize that you already are subject to the gravity of time. Some of you may even have some scars. When we think of that eternal state, when we were given a new body, uh, do you think you will still have your arthritic elbow or or that you'll still have pain in your ankle? No, I don't think so. I'm looking forward to those days when I don't have any of that pain anymore. When we get our resurrected body, it's going to be without pain, without scars. Do you remember when Jesus was in his resurrected body and he met the disciples minus Thomas? And Thomas came in later and the disciples were going, we, we saw him, the risen Lord. And what did Thomas say? And the only way I'll believe it is what? Put my fingers. I put my fingers. Because I saw him. he was crucified. If I put my fingers there in those holes and in the side where the spear was thrust into his side, then I'll believe. Mm -hmm. And you remember Jesus showed up and what did he say to Thomas? Feel this, Thomas. Mm -hmm. Feel this, put your hand here. Mm -hmm. Jesus bears those scars forever. Why? Because the payment he made 
There was something eternal about it. I can't understand it. I can't explain it. But there's something eternal about what he did. And it was so deep that he cries in the garden, my God, if it is possible, dear Father, let's not do this. And yet he says, not my will, but your will be done. And he set his face resolutely to do it. Though he was humiliated, though they stripped him, though they spit on him, they put a crown of thorns on his head and beat him with a reed, though they nailed him to a cross and hung him up in front of everybody, And though he knew that there was going to be a point when somehow the father would turn his face away. I don't know what that is, but it was enough for me to know that Jesus was in agony over that. There's an interesting word in the Greek. We find it here in Hebrews 10. But this man, Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever sat down at the right hand of God. And that's why you know that this separation, Jesus is sitting next to the Father, the the Trinity is still intact. But the sacrifice was a forever sacrifice. The Greek word here is dionekos. It's the same word we see earlier in Hebrews. He remains a priest perpetually. Jesus didn't go through something and got it over. There was something deep about all of this. And that is why Paul is praying. He says, I pray that you may grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge. I'll tell you a a story when we filmed the Truth Project, we had about 25 crew people. And from what I understand, none of them knew the Lord. And I think it was this second or third day, I don't recall, I had a dressing room. And there was a knock on the door. And a gentleman stuck his head in and, uh, and I said, hey. And he said, hey. And he came in and he said, uh, hi, my name's James. And uh, struck out his hand. And you know how some people won't look you in the eye? You know, and, uh, you know, hi, my name's James. And he said, well, I, I, I wanted to shake your hand. And I said, well, hey, James. And I shook his hand. He said, yeah, I, I wanted to shake your hand because, well, this is really making me think. And I said, well, great, James, I'm, I'm glad it is. And he said, but, but I'm just an engineer. And I said, oh, well, my dad was an engineer. And, and uh, he said, oh, well, my dad was a truck driver. And I said, well, that's a great vocation. And he looked at me and he said, that is a great vocation. And he said, well, I just wanted to thank you because this is really making me think. And then, and then he went out. And I thought, well, I, I want to have some more time with James, but it was impossible. <laughs> the, the way that filming went, it was impossible. And so, uh, then I, I mean, I waved at him every once in a while, but it wasn't until the last night we were over filming on Wednesday night, and I was coming out of the dressing room with my wardrobe, and I was walking through the control room, and I saw James in the corner there, and James was pulling some wires, and I said, hey, James, I just wanted to thank you, you know, uh, great professional job, and he, and he he put the cables down, he came over, and he said, he said, no, no, I want to thank you, he said, because, he said, man, this, this really made me think. And, and uh, he said, do you mind if I ask you a question? I said, well, no, James. And he said, look, I, I've studied this, Jesus. When I was in college, I took comparative religion, and, and I studied this, Jesus. But there's something that has bothered me all these years about him. And, uh, and I said, well, well, what is that, James? And he says, I've asked this question hundreds of people and never got an answer. And then I thought, uh oh. <laughs> he said, supposedly, 
Jesus, who you think is God, is now hanging on a cross and he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That doesn't make any sense. That's bothered me all of these years. And I said, well, James, let's, let's think about it for a second. You know, the penalty for our sins is to be separated from God. And, you know, having a crown of thorns stuck on your head doesn't pay that penalty. Being nailed to a cross doesn't pay that penalty. And James, if Jesus hadn't said this, then you and I could be arguing whether or not he really paid the penalty for our sins. Hmm. I'll never forget, he turned around and he said, no one's ever answered that question before. And he said, I guess I've got some things to think about. And I said, well, James, we've all got things to think about, and I'd be happy to think it through with you. And just nodded his head, grabbed his cables, and left. I never saw him again. But if we think about it, if Jesus hadn't uttered that cry, then we could hear, have an argument about whether or not he really paid the penalty for our sins. Questions, comments? It was a tough one. No? Nothing? Bowser. Okay, let's pray. Father, you are the great and awesome God and we don't understand how you did what you have done. We don't understand how it works in the scheme of eternity, but we know it's true, so thank you. Give us a great time in the service to follow where we would worship you through our fellowship and through our music and through our study of your word. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for watching or listening to this teaching on demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. Please consider sending us an email at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com to let us know how this teaching may have helped you. Please also consider joining us in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church, located at 10251 Metro Parkway, Suite 116, Fort Myers, Florida, just south of the intersection of Metro and Colonial Boulevard. Sunday school begins at 9 and worship service at 10 a.m. We look forward to seeing you in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church.